when we look at heating, house heating and uh, space heating, 89% of this heating is taken directly from uh, geothermal energy and the rest is uh, electrical energy, but this electrical energy comes again from renewable sources. And if we look at the power consumption, and now I mean all power consumption, including vehicles, buses, uh, fishing fleets, which is our biggest industry, then 70% of all power consumption comes from renewable sources, while only 30%, which accounts for vehicles, fishing industries, and such, uh, they are from imported fossil fuels. So the next slide. If we look at the energy policy in Iceland, then a large part of the growth in Iceland and the largest reason for why Iceland is uh, doing so well after the economic crisis is because of cheap energy uh, and cheap uh, sources of energy. Uh, Iceland, the Iceland government has a very high ambition. They want to have 100% of all power uses from the renewable energy sources, meaning that we need to find new ways for powering uh, vehicles and, and fishing fleet. Due to this, in I think it was 1995, I decided to take a huge part in the development of uh, hydrogen, so hydrogen power plants. And in 2003, we opened the first public gas station or hydrogen station where you can come and, and fill up your car. And this hydrogen is uh, produced from renewable sources. And Reykjavik also decided to change the public transportation from fossil fuels. So since 2007, 40 public buses in Reykjavik mm -hmm. have been running on hydrogen. And uh, they are all still running today. Now, due to uh, low price of energy and this uh, large amount of renewable energy sources, we want to attract uh, power intensive industries to Iceland because this gives us stable economy, this is positive from Iceland, but from, for the world it makes sure that uh, we reduce uh, the emission of CO2 and uh, the use of fossil fuels. Let me go to the next slide please. Now, as I said, 100% of all energy production is re renewable and 70% of all consumption comes from renewable energy sources. The largest uh, uh, consumption is aluminum smelters, greenhouses, and the fishing industry. And actually, greenhouses in Iceland, greenhouses are not only equipped with lightning, but lights, lights, uh, lights from electricity. But a lot of uh, feeding into greenhouses is warm. It's, it's, they are placed close to geothermal sources so that we can pump hot water into them and keep the greenhouses warm that way. The total energy produced in Iceland is 16.5 uh, uh, gigawatt hours per year. Probably this is uh, not very big for, for Japan, but compared to the population, this is a huge amount. You can see here the figures that uh, hydro has uh, is the largest production of energy we have. But this is also because uh, hydro is what we use mainly to produce energy for our aluminium smelters. But then again, 82% or very close to all of the energy is, is used by power intensive industry. If you go to the next one. Most uh, of the power consumption is close to Reykjavik. This is not only because of the population, but also because we have, uh, out of five smelters, aluminium smelters, we have three close to Reykjavik. Um, and this is why most hydropower is placed there, but we also have most of the geothermal power placed close to Reykjavik. This is, again, because we have uh, greenhouses and space heating from geothermal. So if you go to the next slide, please. Here you can see how this is split up. I will show you later how, um, why we, the, we are using geothermal on these spots, but that, uh, that's 
related to how the plates, North American and European plates, are where they are split. But if you look here, we have greater here, then we have most of our geothermal energy produced here. And this is also where we have the area where we have the highest population and the largest amount of greenhouses. We have most uh, hydro is produced here, and this is mainly because from these glaciers we have uh, large uh, glacier rivers which go through the country here and down into the ocean. So this is the best place to, to put hydropower stations. Up here, this is a new hydropower station, station that was built in 2007-2008. And this station here was built only for a new aluminium smelter, which was uh, built here in the east. So this 30% uh, of uh, hydro energy is, is solely for one power plant uh, or aluminium smelter. So if you go to the next slide, please. Now, a little bit about the history of hydropower in Iceland. In 1904, the first hydropower power plant was set in operation in Iceland. And I'm so lucky to say that I actually come from the town where this was done, in Hapna village, very close to Reykjavik. And uh, in this town, we still have this power plant, and it's running. So it has been, we have built a museum around it, so everybody can come and see uh, where it produced power to a light. And uh, they have opened up the turbine, so when you look into it, you can actually see what the turbine looks like on the inside. Now, uh, in 1915, we already had several uh, turbines for hydropower, which was for producing 379 kilowatts. Now, I have to remember that in 1915, in 2013, we got 320,000. Uh, and in 1915, before the So 379 kilowatts is, is quite a lot amount for that amount of people. In nine, 1965, uh, the government decided that now uh, we should uh, start our own uh, production company. So Landsvetsen was established, and this was a monopoly. So it was owned by the government. why Landsvetsen owns almost all of the hydro plants in the country. And in 2013 or today, we have uh, 13 gigawatt hours per year of production. So this is uh, quite an allowed and a rapid increase in uh, renewable energy production. If you go to the next slide, please. So you can see uh, most hydro plants um, work with the Francis turbine, which means that uh, you build a dam in the mountain or in the river, and you have a reservoir which will fill up, and you have a, a channel or a fall of water which will power, which comes in here and powers the turbine, generates electricity, and the water is put back into a, a river that continues uh, to the ocean then. Because of this, that we are placed on the ridge where the 
the plate going from itself. There's a lot of volcanic activity and there's a lot of heat. And this is where we get our energy source from. So if you take the next slide, please. So you can see the crack. It comes right through here and the another one here. And this is the reason why we have the largest of our uh, geothermal power plants are placed here and here. We haven't been using this one yet because there's not much uh, interest in this area here because mostly of this glacier. It's some of you uh, uh, heard about the volcanic eruption that was three years ago, I guess, that was from this glacier here. So there's, uh, there are some farms in this area, but there's not much interest in Now, the use of geothermal uh, sources is split into two categories in Iceland. First of all, we use it directly uh, to heat up houses. And second of all, we use it the steam to uh, run turbines so that we can make electricity. Already in 1907, the first uh, geothermal uh, source was harnessed. This was a very intelligent farmer out uh, in the country living actually close to this area. This is uh, our largest geysers. He was living close to that and he wanted to, to use the energy he could see was coming from uh, the hot uh, sources. And he built a concrete pipe from one uh, hot spring and into his house and took the steam and uh, warmed up his house by that. And in 1907 in Iceland, Iceland was a very poor country so before uh, the war, most of the houses were actually made with walls from dirt and grass. And then uh, maybe if you had a lot of money, you were able to build the uh, wood fronts of the houses. And then there was grass on top. So they were very cold and, and then in the winter time it could get very cold. You would usually keep the animals inside the house to increase the warmth of the house. So being able to do this it was a huge step in the country's development. So if you take the next slide, please. In 1940 to 1975, Iceland uh, converted totally from oil uh, to, to geothermal district heating. So today, uh, there is only district heating and most of it is geothermal and uh, the rest is electricity from renewable sources, as I said. And today, as I said, 89% of all houses are heated uh, with the direct, direct geothermal power and the rest is heated with electricity and most of it coming from geothermal electricity. So if it's not direct, it's indirect via uh, the power production. For in the Reykjavik, where the largest uh, population is, the, the power plants are not placed indirectly but uh, 23 or 25 kilometers from the city. So there's a large power plant placed 177 meters above sea level, which uh, has a, a number of holes where they are drilled and take the beam up and the water. And then the water is transmitted in these pipes, all the 23 kilometers up to Reykjavik, where it is put in tanks and then distributed into houses. So if you take the next slide, please. There are several uh, geothermal power plants in the country, but I only name a few, just the largest one. Ones, um, and I don't want to mention this one. This is a very special geothermal power plant, because if you've heard of the, the Blue Lagoon, many know that, then the Blue Lagoon is actually a byproduct from this power plant. So the power plant takes the uh, water in, and there are some uh, sulfur in this water and they will use uh, the steam to uh, produce electricity and will you, because of this, uh, this uh, high sulfur you can't send this water directly to houses so you use it in order to heat up cold drinking pump up cold water as well from the ground and you will use this hot water to heat up this cold water and send it to uh, it's in uh, Kepnavik and in that area to south of Reykjavik and then you take the hot water and uh, you, because it's clean, you just pump it into the nature. And then uh, after it's uh, a 
I think it was two years after they started doing this, they started to notice that uh, the water was a little bit more blue than usual. And there was one person who was working at this power plant, he went and tried to bathe in it, and he had psoriasis uh, and illness. And he felt better after doing this. So they started doing tests on the water and found out that this water is very, uh, very good for the skin and for, for the body. So it was made into uh, a place. Now it's a big tourist place. When I, I was a kid, it was mostly for Icelandic people where you would come if you were uh, had this illness. It comes spring, yes. But it's not, it's not a hot spring like other hot springs. It's a byproduct from a power plant. So, yes. So if you take the next slide, slide please. Now most of the largest geothermal power plants we have, they produce both electricity and hot water. Um, you have, uh, you make a, a drill hole and you take the steam and you use the steam to uh, run the turbine who will produce electricity. And then you take the hot water, uh, sometimes you will use that to uh, heat water. Here you take it directly and send it to tanks, but sometimes like in uh, the one with uh, Blue Lagoon, you will use this water here to uh, warm up cold water and send it. And then afterwards, because there's uh, no we don't need to save either energy or water in life, we have enough of it. Then the water, our byproduct, or the water is just put back into the nature. We don't need to recycle it or use it. So if you take the next slide, please. Now I've told you about our largest power uh, industry, which is uh, geothermal and hydropower plants. But now Iceland is looking into wind power production, like the rest of the world. The, the reason for why this is only happening now is because it has been too expensive and we haven't seen why should we do this because we have enough of water and, and heat. But uh, with the discussion of uh, trying to sell energy to the mainland of Europe, we also want to further increase uh, our production. So they are running some tests on wind production in Iceland. And uh, only last month, uh, two wind turbines were put up in the country and this was put up in the highlands of the country where you have flat land but on both sides you have very high mountains so this forms a natural wind tunnel you actually have more you can use the wind even better than if you put it offshore and if the if the production will give uh, good results and they won't be too costly compared to our, our other resources then in this area there is a lot of space to put much more turbines. So you take the next slide please. There's a lot of talk about uh, solar power, uh, especially in, uh, in Germany and uh, it's becoming more and more popular in Denmark as well. And it has been a discussion if this would be adequate for Iceland. But in fact in Iceland we have a 24 hour sun daylight in summertime uh, for one and a half month but the rest of the year is very dark like in, in Finland and actually in winter time in the January and December we have less than one average solar hour per day so there is no they, this will never be used in Iceland and I, I think uh, it's safe for me to say that it will never be used so if you take the next slide please now we talked about production, uh, and I want to show you a little bit about the transmission system. As I said, Iceland has uh, a very low population, and uh, it's only around the coast coastline. There's no population in the middle of the country. But uh, due to history and, and how things have developed, the system is very weak. We only have one circle. We don't have a really mass net, and uh, most of the lines are radial lines. And the total length in today is 3,170 kilometers of overhead lines, which is not too much. It's not very much for this uh, large country uh, in size, I mean. If you take the next slide, Landsnet is 
which is uh, the transmission system operator in Iceland, uh, is making plans with uh, strengthening the system. And uh, it has been very difficult to get a launch to strengthen the system, which is why um, the government actually has put together people into possibility of, of putting on the ground cables instead of uh, only over glass. But there was an unexpected help uh, just in January this year because of very cold weather. And the line there was only one, there's only one line here today. Then the line here uh, uh, went out and had the failure. This meant that all of this uh, part of the country had to uh, save energy, save uh, electricity, which uh, we are not used to in Iceland. Luckily, there are two small power plants up here, but they were not enough to, to power all households and the industry. We have a lot of fishing industry up there, and the fishing industry is the largest industry in Iceland. Mm -hmm. So this is why um, this, this uh, failure has probably uh, an impact for the, for the grid, for the transmission system. So if you take the next. As I said, uh, it's very difficult to get allowance to build uh, more uh, overhead lines. So Lancet made a competition to try and get more ideas for how the towers should look like. Mm -hmm. They were received, I think, about 150 ideas. I think this one is probably the most uh, known worldwide. But unfortunately, it will probably not be, be chosen in Iceland because of uh, difficulties with and expensive with uh, building them. So if we go to the next slide, please. When we talk about transmission system, we talk about different voltage levels. And we talk about a lot of components, not only overhead lines, but uh, we have transformers and we have circuit breakers. There's a lot of extra components and they take a lot of space and most people don't think uh, that this looks so nice. So apart from uh, trying to get uh, new ideas for better poles for overhead lines, there were a lot of uh, ideas for, for new type of uh, uh, power stations, transformer stations. Most of them are in uh, uh, GIS nice uh, indoor buildings where you have the building kind of uh, fitting into the landscape so people won't uh, use it, see it that easily. If you take the next slide, please. As I said, transmission cables are not very common in the ISAT network, but, uh, but the government wants to look into the possibility of uh, undergrounding the transmission system. And this is uh, basically because of what has been happening in Denmark. I don't know if you know this, but uh, the Danish government since 2009 decided to underground the entire transmission system. There are only a couple of 400 kV overhead lines that are allowed to be in operation, the rest will be cables. And uh, some one in Iceland thought this is a very bright idea, this will look nice in our landscape, we should try this. But uh, what I say is that you have to be careful, you probably have a lot of challenges when you're looking at volcanic islands with uh, earthquake and uh, a lot of lava in the countryside. So if you take the next slide, please. There is a hope to be able to connect uh, the country to Europe in order to sell some of uh, the extra power that we can generate. Uh, it is estimated that there is around 50 terawatt hours per year unharnessed energy in the country. This is only geothermal and uh, hydro that I'm talking about, so if we add wind power to this, it will be even more. And this is actually equal to 8% of the entire power consumption Germany, which is why we would like to be able to sell this uh, basically to Germany. Mm -hmm. This has been a dream for the past 60 years, unfortunately, but uh, recent developments in HVDC, ESC uh, converters, and uh, submarine long XLP and plastic uh, submarine cables, which, uh, on, and also deep, both long and deep uh, submarine cables, has made uh, probably for Iceland to, to do this. There is though a large criticism within 
inside the country, uh, and the country will have to, or the government will have to check what will be the effect on the economy, because probably as soon as we connect ourselves to Europe, we will have to obey the market rules in Europe, which means that uh, prices will rise in Iceland. So if you take the next slide, please. These are the possible scenarios of uh, connecting Iceland to Central Europe. The connection to, uh, to Norway is uh, not very probable because Norway has al already a lot of hydropower. And the most likely land which is being discussed the most now is the one uh, to Scotland and then further to the Netherlands. And the uh, U U UK Prime Minister has actually contacted Iceland and is interested in this connection and, uh, and in being part of, of paying for the connection. So if you take the next slide, please. As I said, uh, the electricity market is a little bit different in Iceland than in the rest of Europe and, and northern countries. And this is because it's very small and making a better electricity market is very expensive. It's split into three categories, the uh, power intensive industry, which is the largest one, the general market, and then losses. And it is the transmission system operator that runs uh, the market, or that is most active on the market and has uh, largest, most to say about the market. Um, Landsvikin, who was before a monopoly in, uh, in Iceland, which is Landsvikin is the the production company that was uh, started by the state. They have the largest amount of hydropower and the biggest uh, power production. So this is why they are almost still a uh, monopoly on the power intensive industry. Simply because no one else can produce stable power uh, of the amount that they need. Then when we look at the general market, it, this is actually mostly uh, geothermal and geothermal power is Landsvikin has available, but mostly there are different, many different uh, companies that own geothermal power plants in the country. And then the losses, uh, both uh, geothermal and hydro, uh, that means Landsvikin and all the other power companies, they will bid on the losses. So that's uh, what that's the losses basically what is fluctuating or, or on the open market. You take the next one. The, the idea is uh, that the market becomes more open, like it is in Europe. And Landsnet would like to um, uh, change the market and the structure of the market drastically. But this is very expensive, as I said, in a small country like Iceland, where there are also where there is uh, one very big power generator and then several small, it would be very difficult for the small power generators. So if you take the next slide, please. This is the, the vision of uh, Landsnet, the transmission system operator in Iceland. They want to have uh, protecting diversity, <coughs> hydrogen geothermal and alternative solar will probably never be there. Um, and they need to, in order to support this market, they need to strengthen the grid. This is what they are already working on, not only because of the market, but also because of the need in the country, because of uh, network stability. And then they want to look at uh, the market-based consumption, which is basically what everybody are, talk are talking about when we mention smart grid. But this will probably, will probably be a little bit more about this tomorrow. So if you take the next slide, please. Uh, as I said, 100% of renewable energy sources uh, are put, uh, are give uh, power production. Therefore, there are no gas production or consumption. This means there are no gas pipes in the system. We only have uh, pipes for hot water distribution and transmission, and pipes for cold drinking water. The drinking water comes uh, directly from the mountains or from wells uh, in the country, and uh, Due to the landscape, it's filtered, naturally filtered through the stones, through the lava and through the mountains, which makes uh, one of the cleanest water in the world. And uh, <coughs> this is actually also exported on bottoms to countries with uh, less water resources. 
Transportation is uh, is by vehicles or shipping or flying, but there is no railway in the country. This is too expensive, so there, there has been a lot of discussion, but it's been postponed uh, because of, of prices. And cargo is also mostly shipped on sea, uh, a little bit by uh, trucks, but not very much. So the, the transportation system, when we look at roads, there are no highways, for instance, in Iceland. And the highest, you cannot drive more than 90 kilometers per hour. Do you take the next slide, slide please? So the conclusion is that uh, the largest power consumption per capita in the world in the, is in this uh, small country, but 100% of the production is renewable energy. So we are not trying to save energy as is we see in uh, most of the rest of the world. We actually want to increase energy consumption in the country in the form of having more industry coming in and using our renewable energy sources. Space heating is also only uh, green. We have 89% of uh, direct geothermal and the rest is from renewable uh, electricity by renewable sources. And the very uh, good future plans of uh, the government is to have a 100% energy independent country including all vehicles and all facilities. So if you take the last slide, please. And I just want to thank you for listening. And I don't know if there are any questions.